Welcome to the Barbarian Hour podcast, where we conquer the impossible. The Barbarian Hour podcast is presented by Barbarian Apparel. Here is Jared Opfer and Zeb Miller. Are you ready? Terval Delagnev, welcome to the Barbarian Hour. First things first, I got to introduce you. Tell everybody who uh, the guest is tonight. Tonight we have Olympic bronze medalist in 2012 London, Terval Delagnev. I keep asking to see the medal. Um, they mailed it to you. I, I still haven't seen it. I know you probably got it packed away in some boxes. You just moved to Lincoln. So uh, 2012 Olympic bronze medalist, world bronze medalist, uh, NCAA champion for Kearney in Nebraska, NCAA Division II. Team champions as well, right? Yeah. When you won that match, you won the team title along with that, didn't you? That was. That's was- that. Listen, was that your best moment, like, as far as – putting your team on your back, but you know, obviously they didn't, you didn't put them all on your back, but it came down to you, man. Right. Would you say yeah, that's so one of your best moments as an athlete? Definitely. Well, I remember that senior year was a little bit different for me because I, I had considered transferring and I was going to, I was, I could consider taking an Olympic red shirt and then transferring division one the next year. But then I kind of decided, I didn't know how my credits were going to transfer. I didn't want to like, I just wanted to get done with my degree and start wrestling freestyle. So um, I was kind of, I mean, there were some tough guys in the bracket, but for the most part at the division two level, I was kind of ahead of most of them. And so that year was very much, you know, it it was more stressful because it was, I was, I had so many situations where it was like the duel comes down to me having to like either tech or pin again. Or like, you know, like you win the dual meet if you can pin this guy. And it's like guys just turtle up and it was super frustrating. And so I just remember like, like after, I think it was national duels, we lost the duel and I couldn't pin the guy. And um, I just remember thinking like, man, how come I can't ever, how can't it come ever come down to me just normal winning? Why is it always got to be pinning? And then, you know, uh, you know, like, obviously, looking back, it's like, oh, well, you know, there it was. So it, the, the, the most important moment for the team that year came down to me just winning. And there was some crazy stuff that happened. I mean, Mankato, one of the middleweights, it was either 65, 74, had, like, a guy's leg in the air to major his guy and didn't get it. So there's, like, a lot of things that could happen. And obviously, when you, like, when you're talking about half a point, I mean, I remember in the first round, their heavyweight had a guy on their back, let him off their back, and then took the tech fall instead of the pin. I mean, there's a half point. I mean, it's like st- stuff like that. You start to, like, nitpick all these little situations that could have gone differently, and this, this was the moment they could have won it. This was the moment they could have lost it. But it made everything super dramatic because I remember we thought it was out of reach, like, after the semifinal round or something. Like, one of the – and then and – then, four of our guys got third and it was like these guys stormed down the backside bonus points bonus points so it was like and it was it was just super crazy we had some crazy comebacks it was it was such a I I don't ever remember being more excited for someone else to win a match than I was at that tournament with my teammates was Usman on that team he was he ended up third I think he lost in the semifinal to the eventual champ from Pitts Johnstown and then he got third. He won it once, though, didn't he? Yeah, he got 3-2-1. And he probably, sh- I mean, shoulda, coulda. But he had, he, the only time he ever lost to Brett Hunter from Shattern State, who beat him his junior year, was in the NCAA Finals. So he had like two or three wins over him and just kind of got, got gamed in the finals. So, but yeah, he was one-time champ, but he was really good. So where is he actually you and okay so where was he born where were you born he was i uh, i mean i think he was born in nigeria i think he, he was okay born. so i think he I, I think so too where were you born bulgaria so you guys are both born you're foreign born right mm-hmm. and then you both come to america and you're on the same team that wins the ncaa title dude that's a wild story and you're you know you're u.s olympian when did you 
uh, become a citizen? When did you come over and then when did you become a citizen? I came over in 1990. I would have been, oh, I was four. You're four, okay. And I want to say I became a citizen three years after. I mean, I think I was like six or seven. I don't remember it too well. My dad joined the U.S. Army right away, and so that kind of expedited our citizenship. But my mom and dad had to take some tests. And um, it's literally my, the citizenship test. Yeah, yeah. and then it's just like basic my, civics. Yeah, and then my my sister and I just had to come to this courthouse and like say an oath because we were young, so they didn't make us do any testing or anything like that. Did you have to say the pledge? I think I did. I think I did the plan, and then I, I had to raise up my right hand and say, say, like, repeat after me some stuff, also. And you were like seven years old. And do you, you like remember it, remember it, or kind of like I, I remember like the courthouse, and I remember having to dress up, I remember like the circumstances around it, but I don't remember what we said. It was just kind of like I knew what was happening. I was like, oh, I'm becoming, I'm gonna get citizenship, but was I didn't this think in Texas. Like, uh, this would have been in San Diego. San Diego. Okay. So you guys are in California. Is that where your dad was stationed? That's where he was stationed. That's where we moved to. We moved to San Diego. He was stationed there and then got moved, got transferred to the fort in El Paso there for a couple more years. Then he finished his time in the army. And then my mom, he started to drive trucks. My mom found a janitorial job in Arlington and that's how we went to Arlington. So that, okay. So that's the move, the move from El Paso. So San Diego, El Paso to Dallas, Fort Worth. Yep. So, but Fort Worth, right? Well, Arlington. Arlington. Okay. Where the Rangers play. Yep. The middle, right, right in between the two. Okay. So how was your English? Did you have like, what, what languages were you speaking when you came over? And how, how, how did you pick English up like quick? Um, I actually, <laughs> so I had, some, I, had, I had an interesting time. Um, my sister crushed it. My sister is super smart. My, I had, I, I struggled a little bit. I, I mean, obviously Bulgarian I, I was, was my first language. And then we lived in a year, we lived a year in a refugee camp in Austria after we left Bulgaria. Do you remember any of that? I do. I remember like, tid- I remember the building. There was like one apartment building in like this giant field of grass with like a giant, with a big tree belt around it. And it was kind of like secluded, but there was just a ton of families. And then I remember everyone's door was open and everyone was just, would just hang out on the lawn. And we could, I remember the kids, we would play hide and go seek in the building. And it's like, we would just go in and out of everyone's apartment. Like everyone's apartment was fair game. And, uh, I remember jumping off the second story, out the second story window to try to get away from some kids chasing us, playing tag or something. I remember learning to ride a bike there, um, little things like that. But then we, then we came over. That's when we made the move from there. That's where we got our green cards. It was kind of like purgatory. We came over here. And then that's when we um, – so when we moved here, my parents – obviously, we spoke Bulgarian in the household. But I had, I had learned like quite a bit of German when I was in Austria. So I was almost fluent with, in German for a second, but I lost that pretty quick. That was just four. like. Four. You were four. Yeah. That's, ama- that's incredible because your brain, think about how your brain is processing language. And yeah, because the earlier you can learn a language, the, you know, the quick, and I always ask people this. Do you dream in Bulgarian at all? No, I don't dream or think. I, I dream and think in English. You dream in, okay. Yeah, a lot of people are like, I don't know. That's a great question. Wow. Yeah. I, when you hear I those Bulgarians my, talk, you know, when they're gaming you guys, you, you know what they're saying. Yeah, yeah, I know. I can understand. So how it came to be was my parents would talk to me in Bulgarian, but they would always make me talk back in English to practice my English. So that kind of stuck. So I, my whole life, that, I, st- I still do that with my mom. She talks to me in Bulgarian. I talk to her in English. So it's, it, um, I understand it pretty darn well. I, I can't speak it as well because, again, I think in English. And so if you were like, how do you say this word? 
Sometimes that's hard for me. I'm like, man, I, I, I don't know. But if you're talking to me, I can understand it pretty well. Like recalling one word out of thin air is hard for me. But if you put me in a situation, I can start talking um, pretty well, but understanding much easier than talking it for me. So, okay. It's crazy. You have Carson Karshala. He has a dad, obviously, who was a Soviet U-20 champ in Moran. And and that kid, you know, he got like the, the upbringing. Did you have any... Was mom or dad, did they have any, any affiliation with wrestling at all? No. How did you no. gravitate to, re- how, do, yeah, like that, that, like you, Carson Carson's story is pretty obvious, right? Yeah. How, how do you gravitate to wrestling? You're in a, you're a refugee for a year. You're in a, dude, it's, I don't think people understand. Refugee camps are not always the best places. I don't, I don't think a lot of Americans really get that, Turvel. Sounds like the one you were in wasn't, was, was not bad because everybody had a common goal. Obviously, they were traveling and transient and moving and trying to get here or there, right? Yeah, I mean, again, I don't remember it being a bad place. Like, obviously, but, but the thing about being a kid is you, you just – you don't see – there's an innocence to being a kid because there, a lot of the stories from my childhood that I – when I tell them back, I'll be like, wait a second, that can't be right. And then I'll be like, wow, yeah, no, that's, yeah, that happened and this happened. So it's like, I, like as a kid, you experience a lot of things, like as a matter of fact, like, well, that's just, that just happened. That's just life. But like going back through your own life as an adult with some perspective, you're like, man, that, that was weird. That was weird. That was dangerous. That shouldn't have happened. That wasn't okay. So it's kind of funny like that. But yeah, I don't remember ever being like, like, you know, oh, I'm at this refugee. I just remember being like, oh, there's a bunch of kids here. Let's party. <laughs> hey, let's jump out of the second floor window while you guys chase us. Yeah. Oh, that, see, that, that's – I love that perspective, though. Like, that's the beauty of being a kid, you know? Like, oh, yeah. my, my kid tonight wouldn't do the uh, monkey bars at the playground, and he crushes the monkey bars. He fell yesterday when it was wet, and I made him do it, and I dried him off, and he, like, slipped and fell on his ribs. And he's like bummed out, but he'll forget about that the next time we go there. They're, you know, like kids are resilient, right? Like you're, yeah. let's party. Hey, there's a bunch of other kids here. Let's hang out. Let's, let's run till we puke. Yeah. And I'm thinking like now as an adult, it's like, man, for the adults, it's like, I'm sure a lot of those families were split up. Like, I mean, not a lot of people, a lot of people were trying to, it was like the kind of the, the, the end of the communist regime, kind of the, 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 the Soviet Union was splitting apart. And so a lot of those Eastern European countries were kind of taking, you know, a, a tone and governmental shift and, and just their economy is built for us. So there was going to be a lot of, a lot of, um, you know, wipe out, pretty much a wipe out of the middle class in, in some of those areas. And there was going to be a lot of poverty and stuff. And, and it was going to be, um, I mean, for, for, as an adult, you're taking your family, you might, you, you know, you're leaving your extended family who knows when and it's like i'm sure the logistics of that situation were a nightmare for the parents but for for the kids it was like oh we're we're just here so let's 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 see what we can do and have fun so you guys get here dad joins the army immediately um did you bring it this is i know this is a weird question (laughs) did you come over on a boat or did you fly over See, so that's really interesting. I, I'm pretty sure we flew. I'm pretty sure we flew. You don't but, know that. Well, I can't, I can't remember. I can't remember either way. I'm, I'm guessing you flew. I had to have flown. Because yeah. what, we're going yeah. we to boat, boat to Massachusetts and then drive across the country. Yeah. So the you fact flew. that I remember it has to be a plane. Um, I know we took a train from Bulgaria to Austria, but I can't okay. remember. Listen, life- Russia and Europe train, they're train crazy, dude. Train crazy. Uh, I, I took a, when I was in the Russian, went to the Russian nationals, we took a train to Kazan from Moscow and it was like 20 hours. <laughs> it was great. I was like, and, uh, uh, God Solov was on the train with us. That's awesome. And he beat that dude, that, uh, Romanian, not the Romanian dude. He beat the guy, Ibr- Ibr- Ibrahimov, I think the dude's a heavyweight now. He looks like a mini bone. Oh, yeah. He looks yeah. like a gigantic bono. You know what I'm talking about? 
Oh yeah, yeah. The belt. He's he wrestles for Belarus. Yeah, I think he's a. I think he's an Olympic medalist, didn't he? Yeah, he he medaled in Rio. Yes, that guy. Godzalov beat him in the finals. Godzalov t- was on the train with us, and I'm like, yeah. "What is this? How is this guy on the train with us? What what is happening right now? Like, it's not good for him to take the train. I mean, when you can fly and do it in two, an hour and a half as a person, right. twenty hours, on the train. twenty hour train ride. Well, did it have like beds or was it just yeah? Like a it was it had the cochettes and all that. It was, yeah, it was nice, dude. It was cool. I mean, it was Joe Williamson and I, and we had a Russian dude with us named Tigran, but. I just couldn't believe it. Like it blew my mind. I'm like, this guy's an Olympic gold medalist. He's a multiple time yeah. world champion. I'm like what, what is going on? Why is that guy on our train? But it's just, it's how it is over there, by the way. I mean, oh, for sure. it's crazy, but you guys took a train. You don't know if you flew. Did you take a train at all in the United States? It's kind of not a thing. I don't think so. I've it never... is a thing, but just not, not yeah. you know, more like, Oh, we're going to take a train. It's fun. Yeah, exactly. It's so, wild, but, so here's, here's one more story about my learning the language. So I, San Diego, I get plucked into a, like a bilingual class, like English, English is a second language. Everything's peachy keen. We moved Everybody's to we, speaking Spanish. Exactly. Everyone's speaking <laughs> Spanish. I'm learning a lot of Spanish at this point. But so I, I moved to El Paso in second grade. So I start second grade and they actually put me in a standard class like a normal class. And so I, I didn't know. So, so at the beginning of the class, stand up and say the Pledge of Allegiance. I have no idea what it is. So I'm like, um, and, and she's like, put your hand on your heart. So I slap my hand on my heart. And she's like, your right hand. So she comes over, she changes my hands, the teacher. And she said, I remember her being like super abrasive. So I'm like panicking. And then I'm like, mumbling because i don't know what they're talking about i don't know this because we didn't do the pledge in 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 san diego and bilingual class so 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 now that i think about it i must have become a citizen in el paso because i I had never done the pledge pre-second grade and so i she's like do you not know the pledge of allegiance so i'm like oh no i don't know and so then she's like whatever so then we start we start class and we're doing this thing where we're reading a paragraph and then we, you know, you read three lines and then you go to your next partner and then that person reads three lines and it gets to me and I'm sounding it out just for now. Like, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm doing my best, but I'm super slow at it. And she's like, do you, she's like, are you dumb? Do you need to be in, do you need to be in bilingual class? She said that to me. So I remember being like super embarrassed. I remember going home that night and being like, I'm never going back to school. Screw this place. But then, so I was like super discouraged, but then they, they figured out, okay, so they, they got me in the right class and I ended up having like the best teacher ever. And so it actually like, but, but I did learn a lot of Spanish and most of the cuss words at that, but it was like, <laughs> well, like fifth grade, I was in bilingual class in El Paso with just learning more Spanish than I'm English, but had a really good experience. But I remember that first, like first like day was like, oh, this is miserable. I can't do this. So, okay, so you you live a relatively regular childhood. You guys eventually moved from El Paso to Arlington, right? Yeah. And then when does the wrestling flyer come home or when does one of your buddies you go to a party and they're what's what's the what's the moment with wrestling when you discover wrestling and when's wrestling discover you? Um, well, not for a while. So go through junior high, for freshman year of high school, I see wrestling as an elective on the like the class schedule list and i i think like oh that's so cool like that's like stone cold in them like i'm thinking w because i was a wwe fan and so i'm like wait and then so no one someone explained to me like no that's like the other wrestling so how how they explained wrestling to me was you 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 interlock you you interlock fingers and then you basically play mercy so that's how wrestling that's how real that's how real <laughs> wrestling that. explained to me right yeah so so I'm like, oh, that's cheesy. I don't want to do that. So I don't do my freshman year. My sophomore year, same thing. But then like about three months in, so around the time wrestling season is starting, around November, I'm kind of seeing – so during PE is, you know, if you if – in, in my high school, wrestling, you have a wrestling class. So during your school. So you have your last hour of the day is your whatever – 
your, whatever sport you're in, you have that for your sport. So a lot of those coaches use that hour for like strength and conditioning. And then after school, you have your practice. Well, I'd always, during P class, I'd always see the wrestlers running, lifting. And at that, at that point in my life, I was, I was kind of like geek, starting to geek out on like fitness. I wanted to, that was kind of chubby. I had never done any sports in my life. And I was thinking like, I want to get committed to something. I want to like, you know, harden up, get jacked, get muscles, like look like the people on the magazines. You know what I mean? Uh, I so I'm it. thinking, I'm thinking, I just got to start, I got to, I got to work hard. And so I see these wrestlers and I'm, and I, so I kind of tell my, my PE coach, I'm like, you know what? I think I'm going to join wrestling because that'll, that'll help me get jacked. Those guys are jacked. And he's like, well, I can say something to the wrestling coach. And so I'm passing. I'm like, hey, hey do it, do it. But I didn't think anything. So he tells the wrestling coach, the wrestling coach comes in and it's like, yeah, come on, come on out. So I'm like, all right. So I went out and that was kind of like the first taste of it. So I went out that year. So wrestling season was starting. Freshman year or sophomore year? I lost track of it. Sophomore year. Sophomore year. Freshman year passed. Sophomore year this is. Yeah. Sophomore year, like halfway through the first semester around November. And so I went out for the first practice and then never looked back. I was the most sore I'd ever been in my whole life after that first practice. My whole body hurt. And I was like, oh, yeah, I'm going to get jacked. Let's do this. It happened. Eventually worked <laughs> out for you. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> for you, I think. Uh, so, first off, what was your high school? Arlington High. Ar- so Arlington, how many schools has it got now? Now, I mean, probably more than ten. I mean, at the time, I think it had like six or seven Arlington, and then it was like, I mean, it, but it's like a metroplex, so it's like you, you can't tell when Arlington turns into Plano, turns into Grand Prairie. Like, I mean, it's like all these suburbs, but it's just one giant city. It's yeah, like you're saying, it's a megalopolis almost. Yeah, it's just it's massive. But I think there was like our districts had I don't know seven or eight now i think they're up to like 12 or something wow so okay so did you play football i didn't i didn't so once i started wrestling and i got good at wrestling the football players so there were like a couple of football players came out for wrestling and i, I kind of put it on them a little bit and i was smaller so like dude you should do football so i, I like i like kind of like considered it because it was like oh yeah those are the cool kids but i didn't really i didn't i came from a bulgarian family and american football was never like something that we valued or even understood and so by the time i like i mean i liked watching it and stuff but it never the only position i like playing it in pe class but it's like it just wasn't realistic because the only position that excited me was wide receiver like i would tell the coach like can i play a wide receiver he's like stop like <laughs> you gotta you can like, like and he tried to get me excited he's like you can hit people i'm like i don't want to hit people i want to catch the ball and he's like oh you probably can't do that <laughs> So you'd have been a wide receiver. You'd have been like the biggest dude. I don't think. I don't think there's like there's some pretty big dudes now that are. Super there's, there's, yeah, there's some massive people, but they're, they're also huge. they're probably run faster, jump higher than I did. So. I, I would tend to think that what's it? <laughs> Calvin Johnson's massive. Megatron. Oh yeah, those Man, I mean, uh, Plexico Burst was. Ma- I mean, we're talking six, 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 seven, six, eight guys like oh, yeah. that run four, three, four, 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 two. I mean, they are mute. No, it, it's, it's probably, I mean, it's gotta be, I mean, that are running back are the most athletic positions in football, uh, right? Yeah. Uh, the cornerbacks too, man, the cornerbacks, yeah. are, they're, they're, but they're undersized now compared to a lot of the, the wide receivers. Like I'm saying, it's, it's just wild. It's not the most, I mean, those are some of the most athletic humans on the planet. Yeah, period. Or, I've tried to tell period. this to people. I like my wife's got this Australian guy. He's he's your friend, and I go, dude, if we sent our NFL players and we trained them to do, obviously any of the 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 Australian football, the rugby, anything that they're doing where you're running into other people, <laughs> listen, if we could send a roster of our defensive backs out and teach them how to play soccer for a couple of years, they could at least just hurt the other guys. <laughs> and yeah, they, they and kill I, us in soccer. I mean, you, you know that soccer is your guys' sport. Oh yeah. We get, I, my family geeked out on soccer. I mean, the Europeans and the, the Asian countries, the European countries, obviously South America. I mean, they are, it is like, dude, it's like, it's like what a lot of Americans act like about football. Oh yeah. But people don't get it because, like, Americans don't get it. Americans – because a lot of Americans never leave the United States of America, so they don't go see those other cultures. 
and just how much they really care about, you know, football, soccer. Right. And, and just a lot of Americans will never get it. Right. They just, they yeah. don't, they're never going to get it. And that's just how it is. And it's just how cultures work. Right. What is the progression of sophomore year to senior year? Do you qualify for the state? Are you a state placer? Are you a state champ in Texas? Um, yes, yes, no. So I, sophomore year, I was failing a class. So I, I went out, I, I didn't miss a practice, but I wasn't very motivated in school. Like I would just do no homework. I would, I would pass my tests. I would just kind of skate by with minimal effort. Well, so sophomore, we had no pass, no play. I don't know if you guys still have that, but it's like, if you're failing a class, you can't compete on the high school team. So I basically didn't compete at all. I just went to all the practices as a sophomore. Got jacked. Got jacked. Well, I lost a lot of weight. I wouldn't call myself jet, but I went from like 220 to like 165. No way. Yeah, so I lost. But I was like on crazy diets, and I didn't understand like actual healthy fitness. I just thought work out really hard, don't eat any fat, and you'll – you'll lose fat and get big. But, but so then I started to get, so then that summer, my coach drug me around to some like AAU nationals. I wrestled Greco. I wrestled Sambo. I wrestled freestyle. He took me to state freestyle. I wrestled a couple things there. He took me to all these tournaments and that's kind of when I really started geek out. So I got up to about 185, kind of starting to, you know, eat a little more healthy and actually, eat and, and, and train a little smarter. And so my junior year, I got real motivated. I wanted to wrestle. I wanted to compete. And so I got my grades up and that was my first year to compete. So I got fourth that year at state. And then what weight? Uh, 180. So Texas had a weight class in between 171 and 189. It was 180. And so I wrestled 180. So cut a little bit of weight nothing crazy and then my senior year I'm up to about 208 so I decided because we went from 189 at the time to 215 so I didn't want to cut all the way down um so I just went 215 my senior year and I got third so you're fourth and third in Texas in high school for for Arlington High School Arlington High and you just wanted to get jacked how does that yeah. take you? Like, how do you even get, did you do Fargo? What, what was the aha moment for UNK to like recruit you or did you walk on? How does that thing happen? Yeah. So I did go to Fargo, but I didn't, I mean, I went two and two and I think like three and two or four. I did two and two in freestyle, three and two in Greco as a junior. And then I went two and two in freestyle and four and two in Greco as a junior or as a senior. But it was coaching connections. So my, my high school coach was a Kearney high grad and he did his master's at Kearney at UNK and Mark Bauer, who was my head coach at Kearney. He was the head coach of UNK. His little brother, Andrew Bauer was my assistant coach at Arlington high. So they're like, you know, they obviously put in a good word and they're like, Hey, you know, this kid, he doesn't have a lot of accolades, but he's been wrestling for two years. His, you know, his trajectory seems to be, you know, pretty, like improving pretty quickly, you know, give him a chance. So I got, I think he gave me like 600 bucks, $600 scholarship. So I was pumped. Plus, I mean, I was able to score relatively well on my SAT. So I got my out-of-state tuition waived and the, the school at the time was pretty cheap. I remember I could go, I could do two semesters. I was, I think it was 9,000 bucks for a year. Wow. Wow. So what was your SAT, by the way? <clears throat> I don't know. I think like right around 12. That's pretty good, dude. That's really good. Yeah, I remember you it was. You didn't like I, school? I didn't like school. Well, I wasn't the structure of school. I, I'm not, I wasn't a good like paper writer or like homework, like I could take tests well. Like I could, I could like remember information and divulge it on a test. So I was a pretty decent test taker, but I couldn't, I had a hard time like consistently, like I, I had a hard time like actually learning in school. Like I could like cram, test, take, forget it all. Cram, test, take, forget it all. So 
you get to Carney, and are you a 197 pounder to start or do you just go right up into the heavyweight? How, what, how does the progression work from $600 scholarship to last guy on the mat, win the NCAA team title, two-time Texas state placer to NCAA champion? How, how was the progression there then? You know, sophomore year at Arlington High, you're not even on the team, you're ineligible, to now you're on this D2, NCAA D2 team that's pretty good, right? Mm-hmm. How, how does that progression work for you? Well, so first year, uh, I actually, they recruited me because cause I was a light 215. So they're saying 204. So they're like, well, you know, he's, he's kind of, you know, he's relatively pudgy. I wasn't like fat, but it was like, can, so they said, can he make 184? So that was, <laughs> so that was the game. The game was because we had, they had a returning All-American at 197 who was really good, who actually ended up winning the Nationals my true freshman year. So he's he's freshman all American as a sophomore. He won the D two nationals, and his sophomore year was my first year there. And so I came in, and at the time I had a lot of I was I, was, I actually understood wrestling pretty well. Like I was really good in the practice room, but I, it was my third year wrestling. You know, my first my co- my first year in college was my third year wrestling. So it's like I didn't I didn't understand how to win the matches, right? So like in a, in a close match, I was super stressed out and I'd make a stupid mistake or like I would shoot myself out or I would just, you know, I just, I didn't understand. So like in practice, I actually had some, you know, I, I would like, I came in and right away and I like, you know, you know, had some good practices. I, I had a bunch of takedowns on one of the national champs at 74 that had just, his name was Frank Cuchera. I had like two or three takedowns on him in, a, in our, one of our first practices. He was just coming in to like flow and so people were like, oh, dang, this, this kid's, like, pretty good. And so I, I got down to 84, and I started, and I did okay. But, you know, when it came to, like, high-level guys, they kind of kicked my butt. I mean, I got pinned by a UNI kid. I got pinned by Tom Meester, who ended up being the national champ at 84 that year from Augustana. I got – I mean, yeah, it was just – it was stuff like that. So it's like I, I would always place, and I'd have, like – decent results but nothing like uh crazy and then when it came to national duels i broke my foot i broke my foot and actually it would have been it would have been it was was another duel tournament in texas i broke my ankle but nothing showed up on the x-ray and so i tried to wrestle on it and i'm cutting all this weight and i have no idea how to cut weight so i'm miserable and i'm trying to wrestle my foot hurts and finally i get it rolled on again in practice so they took an mri and then they found a couple broken bones so i I did the thing where like you didn't have kind of like logan did where it was like i I began i was going to be the starter but i didn't have 20 percent of my season so I, i i basically burned my red shirt and my medical right then and there and then so that summer i remember my coach was like hey get ready now be disciplined you know 84 and i'm like yeah coach for sure and i just went and just ate everything i could i'm like i can't do it (laughs) so i I got up to like 220 and i'm like you know i'll just be a light heavyweight it is what it is and so that was kind of the the red shirt freshman year was my first first go at heavyweight and that's kind of how it started what was your finish did you qualify for the nationals I did. So I, I was I was actually second. I was ranked second. I had beaten everyone besides Sigmund. I was ranked second as a freshman going into the nationals. Um Sigmund kicked my butt in the semis. We drew same side. So so it's kinda of like the Ohio tournament where where they do regions and then one wrestles four, two wrestles three, and then yeah. two regional champs on the same side. So we drew same side. He kicked my butt in the semis and I did the semifinal slide. I, I lost in the I lost a six. So I got six sophomore year. I kind of solidified myself as a solid two. I had beaten a couple of D one higher nationally ranked guys. I beat a couple of, uh, all American type caliber guys. And so I beat, I beat, uh, what would I be? I beat Bodie Ogunwole, the Harvard guy. You remember him? Big, tall, six foot eight dude. No, he's short, short, stocky guy. Really? No, who am I thinking of? Who's the big, gigantic? T- there's a huge guy. 
Not your mail Porter, dude. There was a massive dude. But well, you so you beat the Harvard guy. There was another guy I remember that was just like this. Oh, Leon's Crump was huge. Leon's Crump was giant. He was massive, little, right? Like he was yeah, six yeah. seven. He was he was Tommy's era. Yeah. Yeah. He was, okay. Yeah. So I, I I confused there. But you beat the Harvard guy. Beat the Harvard guy. He was ranked like fifth or sixth. I think he ended up all Americaning that year. Um, couple couple guys like that at like Vegas and stuff. But so I get made to the finals. Sigmund beat me one zero. Uh, I, I chose neutral. He always rode me. A lot of our matches went like this. I got the first takedown. I chose bottom. He rode me. He rode my right arm for two minutes. And then he get like three or four takedowns. Cause I was just dead in the third. Wow. Um, but, but yeah, he was really good on top. I mean, he was good everywhere, but so then he graduates I come in my junior year. I beat. Um, I, I win the nationals as a junior. That's when I won one Midlands. Who'd you beat? beat Who all? I beat. Uh, beat Dustin Fox in the finals. Oh my god! Ohio guy. Yeah, that's who beat JD in his NCAA final. I know. Yeah. So was that the year that he wrestled JD in the finals? No, that was the year before. So I think he got third. He got, he got third. third. Yeah, he got third as a junior. Third as a junior, one at the Italian. Next. Yeah, he was he was big. He's he big was dude. Mass. He was cutting down to two eighty five. Yeah, he's a giant man. Giant guy. So you beat who'd you beat in the semis? Matt Fields, jacked up dude from Iowa. I remember Matt Fields. Okay, and then and who else? I beat uh this Sacred Heart guy. Do you remember? Oh, Pian- the Iranian dude. Yeah, the Iranian dude. Two thousand seven All American in Detroit. I remember him. Yeah, yeah. So I be I be him in the quarters. That he, uh, listen, they had their first NCAA qualifier under John, their first. They had two this year under John Clark. Oh yeah, that's sick. They had two. They had two qualifiers this year at EIWA, and it's just yeah, that's cr- it's so crazy. So you beat three real legit guys, and there's yeah. probably another guy there that I bet you there's another guy you wrestled that was probably in a D1 qualifier. Well, yeah, so all, the, all three of those guys were All-Americans. Um, I think Bubba Gritter was in the bracket. Bubba Gritter, Central Michigan. Yeah, he was on All-American. Wow. And then, well, so you know who actually got third that tournament? So I got first. Fox was second. Mark Ellis. Um, no, not Mark Ellis. It was um, a guy named Blake Gillis from Wartburg. He was a D3 guy. Tall, light-skinned, light-skinned black guy. Really, really good on top. Shoot low singles, um, really. I mean, yeah, he, he was. He, I was first. He was third. D three, D two at Midlands. Wow. I remember he had a scrap. We we wrestled all the time. He was really good. When okay, but, so so Les Les had your number. When was the first time you beat Les? S- beginning of senior year, he was done with college. Well, the first time. So so I had the first time I had a common opponent with him. So as a junior. I went out to the Open, U.S. Open, and I wrestled, and I, I outplaced him. I think he lost – I don't remember. I think he lost to Zabriskie in kind of a weird match. He kind of, like got, like, got tired. Zabriskie dogged him out or something. But it was, like, one of these matches. Then I beat Zabriskie, and then I beat Greg Wagner. And then – um, yeah, Michigan guy. And I ended up fourth at the Open. Um, Was this be, like, 08? So, it would have been – Seven oh seven. So it was Tommy. Tommy first. Cole Conrad second. Mako beat me for third. Oh my God, that was a weight you were in. Yeah, so it was crazy. So I mean, Pat Cummins got seventh. Greg Wagner at eighth. Hey, who's this D two guy? Is that kind of like? Yeah. So they're like. I mean, I had my my buddy like like screen printed me a, a a singlet that said Twister Wrestling on it. Like I had, you know, I just went out just like I. I entered the Loper Wrestling Club, which was not a thing. I just, I mean, <laughs> I just went out there and, and scrapped. And so then the next year, I went to Sunkiss Open, Sunkiss Kids Open in Arizona. And Sigmund, the weight class was, I beat Mike Faust, the Virginia Tech heavyweight, in the semis. And then Sigmund beat Cole Conrad in the oh semis. My God. And then so Sigmund and I were in the finals, and that's the first time I ever beat him. 
he beat I, he beat me one zero on a push out first period. Then I beat him one 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 one. He pushed me out. I low singled him. He pushed me out. I low singled him. The next two periods. So you finally, you finally, how did that feel? Cause he, he had your number in college. Yeah. I mean, I felt good. I don't remember being like super, like it wasn't like, I was obviously really excited, but I don't remember it being like this epic, like, like how I got over the hump. I, cause, cause I do remember being like, I think it could be different because he can't ride me. You know, I remember being like, Oh, freestyle, freestyle might be a little easier. And plus I was, I was at that point. So when we wrestled my freshman, sophomore year, his junior, senior year, I was like 215. Like I was weighing in at the nationals at 215, 216, where my, like in between my sophomore and junior year, I jumped up to like 235. So when I wrestled him at Sunkist, I was like 237. So I was about 20 pounds bigger and with no folk style top bottom, I thought I was like, okay, we can equalize this a little bit. And then obviously I ended up beating him. And he, he I mean, he beat me since. So it wasn't like I got over the hump and I never looked back. He was really yeah, good. He- he beat you in 2009 in Omaha, didn't he? He beat me in 2010. 2010 in Omaha, right? The two out of three. Yeah, two out of three. I called the matches. I remember I was Matt's side, and I was like, because he's a real soft-spoken guy. Yeah, he is really quiet. Real quiet, soft-spoken guy. And then you didn't look back after that, though. I don't think you ever lost to him again after that, did you? No, I beat him. I beat him best of three. Uh, the next year for, to make the team, which two, two D2 guys in the, in, the, in the Olympic trials finals. And then did you, how did you do in 2011? Did you, you medal, didn't you? I, I won in 2000. Oh, I made the team. I didn't medal. I, I lost uh, in the bronze medal match. So that's, that was like the weird, that's when I beat Tim Ozoff, but then I lost two clinches in the semis. I had like six ball pools go against me. That, and that's the only year I lost to Shimero. So I, I always beat that Belarusian, but that's the year he won it. So I beat him in 2009. And I beat him in 12, and I beat him in 13. But the year he, he, he went on a run, he beat me in the semis, and then he beat Makov in the finals, that Belarusian guy. Um, so, yeah, that was, I was like freaking – Makov, the big Russian dude who does UFC, and then he did Greco and freestyle, that guy? Yeah. Yeah. By Lil Makov. Yeah, by, yeah, he got second to Shimerov that year. Who beat he, me was third. he was third in uh, uh, London, wasn't he? third in london well technically now yeah, if, well, yeah not now right or now one he, there, he's sharing gold with gasemi yeah so where's the medal dude i don't have it yet what There's, what they're not so so i don't know it's it's still like they're waiting for the uh, everyone to return the medals and i'm thinking like well they're not going to return the medals like just make replicas but yeah i don't know usa wrestling assures me later on <laughs> it, but it <laughs> wait they <laughs> They're gonna send you. The, they're gonna send you those guys' medals that they've had for ten years almost. Yeah, is that what you're saying? It's super weird. I don't know. Come what on, man. Playing, but they, come, come on. Yeah, it's bizarre. You don't have the medal yet. No, I know medal, you don't yeah. care, dude. I know you don't even care. I know you do not care at all. Listen, man. I toured around London with your uh, your wife and JD and a bunch of people, a bunch of your, the fans that were there to watch you after you lost. And I was working for Flo, and I really wanted to come and interview you and Jake Herbert, man, but I knew you guys were f- just freaking crushed. And your wife was just like, no, I mean, he's going to be okay. But I remember seeing you guys in the lobby because we were there for everything. I was at your bronze medal match when you lost to Gassemi 2012. Yeah, it was, it was Gassemi, wasn't it? Yeah. I was like, he's got this guy. He's gonna get this. He's gonna get a medal. We're all gonna go out to this. We went to this party. I remember where Jordan Burroughs kept smashing the top of my beers. <laughs> I'm like, oh, stop it! Oh, I gotta chug it now. And he was just pumped to be a gold medalist. But and then, yeah, it was. I, do you remember? Did you go to that party, or you probably wasn't run into that party? No, I, I don't think I did. I was pretty bummed after that. I didn't do. I mean, looking back, I kind of handled it like a little poor sport, but. I didn't do any partying. I, I, I mean, not to say that you're like a party guy at all, but it's just like kind of like you're there and the whole team's there, you know what I mean? But my thing was I wanted to talk to you so bad, man. But it was like just awkward. It's really hard to talk, and that's a big thing I know you've found as a professional now. It's like if we want to be a big boy sport, you got to, you know, these pro guys, they talk in any major league baseball, NBA, they talk after a loss. Yeah. And, and I think that's the biggest thing I've found is that those are – 
kind of some of the more remarkable, I think, interviews that I've done. It's, you know, I did the runner-ups in 2018 at uh, Cleveland. Yeah. For NCAs. And, man, you just – you gain a lot of insight. You know, Bryce Meredith was real good. Uh, Imars was really good. Adam Coons was really good. Uh, Soriano's was pretty good. And, you know, you talk to these guys, and I, I think you gain a lot of perspective. That's the thing Johnny DeJulius, though. You and I talked off air. Johnny DeJulius kept, you know, just quoting you and, and your mindset and a lot of things you say about, you know, how we make goals and we're tied to these goals and we, we let goals define us. And then we don't accomplish them. I think a lot of people are lost. Where, where, where is Johnny coming from? And, and when do you think you get, you've told that to those guys, the, the, the things he was saying? Um, I mean, th- that's, we've talked a lot about that. I mean, I've talked to a lot of people about that. I think that's one of the things that I, I mean, just as an athlete, you get a lot of self-reflection, especially in a sport like wrestling, which is why I really love it, which is why I think everyone should wrestle. You know, I think that everyone should wrestle. There's a lot of things that you can gain from wrestling, but the, 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 one, the one main reason I think everyone should wrestle, even if you don't like it, just you got to do it for one or two years because it will grant you a level of self-reflection that is darn near impossible under the same circumstances. Like you can get, it's a very brutal shaking but it's a very safe, it's, 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 it's a safe shaking. So what it, it's like, like most things that you need to pick you up. And I use the, 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 the analogy of shaking. So let me explain that. Life, your life is like a cup of water with a bunch of dirt in it. And so if you set that cup of water on the table for long enough, the dirt will settle to the bottom. And so most people, they sip off the top and they say, my life's clean. I'm good. I have, I have, I have, I have, I have strong character. But then something comes around and shakes that cup up. And then suddenly now you sip it and pff, I, have, I have all this crap, right? I have this dirty water. And so I think the problem with that is most things that shake your cup up and really give you, self, you know, self-reflection and an opportunity to change are things like, you know, hey, ring, ring, 3 a.m., your brother just got in a car accident. Or, hey, um, you know, you're, tomorrow we leave for Afghanistan. You know, like, like, like real life, visceral shaking happens with these, these kinds of crazy moments where you lose a loved one, you know, diagnosed with something crazy, um, you know, some, something happens and, you know, you're, you're going to war, um, you, lose, you lose a job and, and, and you, you're, you're you have no way to provide for your family, stuff, stuff like that. It's like real life stuff. But what wrestling is, it's why it's so unique, is it gives you a constant like shaking and it feels like it's life or death, but it's not. So, so it's a very good mix of it's going to give you a chance to self-reflect. It's going to show you how, how dirty you are. It's going to show you how fearful you are. It's going to show you how, how messy your room is. It's going to show you how, how, how the holes, the gaping holes in your character and how, how really not tough you are. And, but it's going to do it in a way that it's like, well, no one's dying afterwards, right? There's a little bit of embarrassment. There's a little bit of that. But if you choose to change, wrestling is there to show you that you should change. And so that's why I think everyone should wrestle. But the problem with that is if you don't catch these sort of lessons from it, and this, is, this goes back to sports in general, they leave you – they kind of leave you with this, like, at least the rhetoric in, in our country is if you achieved your dreams, you can hold yourself above people. Like, feel free to be cocky. Feel free to be arrogant. Feel free to, to, to live above people if you've made it in sports. And the alternative is if you didn't achieve your dreams, your failure, good luck. Right? So, so there's no, like, it leaves you with this like um, bizarre kind of like identity crisis because I don't think either are healthy. I don't think just because I'm better than you at a sport shouldn't give me a right to be better than you as a person. Like I shouldn't treat, I shouldn't hold myself above people because I'm good at a sport. I should treat them with, with the amount of respect as per their personality, how they treat me, what they've earned and just be a good person. 
And so learning to be humble on the winning side and also learning to have a self-identity that's outside of winning, like being, being okay with the journey, being okay with how you're just you're the level that you improve being okay. I, I fell short of my goals, but there's so many things that I improved in that the journey was worth it. Okay. So there's a lot to unpack there for me. And there's just a bunch of a series of questions and I'm going to let you answer them. Johnny, the Julius very much was his identity and our identity in, in D1 wrestling, which you were a coach at Ohio state sent your Olympic run and you were an RTC athlete player coach, basically after, after London through Rio, the Rio Olympics where you were in both Olympics. <clears throat> Johnny's identity and our identity is very much so in D one wrestling was, was this person an all American, you know, uh, the coaching ranks was this person a D one all American. And I know that's flawed. I, I know that's flawed. I, I don't, I don't agree with that, but that's the world we live in. And that's what division one college wrestling is very hungry for that. And that's the standard, right? Yeah. Johnny talked about, you know, he didn't achieve his goals, but you know, you were talking about all the, the journey you're missing out on the journey, our identity, right? Oh, uh, Hey, good luck. Oh, you didn't achieve your goals. Good luck. Right you're not learning during the climb and you're not taking the good things away from this, the positives, the work ethic, the building of the camaraderie and the relationships and being disciplined and going to work out when you don't want to work out and helping people that you don't maybe want to help. And sometimes you got to go to war when you're hurt. Right. I mean, there's all these things. There are just so many lessons, man. And it's just like, but we're worried about the, well, what were they all American? Right. Well, he he said you really helped him through that. You really helped him through his identity and not being an all American and and being satisfied with the journey. I guess. Yeah, but, yeah. Just just kind of. I guess. Is that how you felt about maybe not winning an Olympic medal, but winning an Olympic medal? How, how does how does the call come through? At was it twenty nineteen they called you? Yeah. You know, this is something from twenty twelve. Hey, the guy who suicide cradled you, blind suicide cradled you in the semis was dirty. Yeah. And stripped of multiple Olympic gold medals. Multiple, right? Well, what was it like? How do you process it then, Terval? I mean, at that point, you, you move on, right? So, so, so it was hard at first, but the further away it gets, I mean, I, I made it a very, very punctual point to – to get a hold of my identity and to place it, you know, into my faith and into, you know, who I wanted to be. And I chose, you know, you make decisions about stuff, right? You make decisions about against your feelings. So there's ways we want to feel, we want to feel sad. We want to, we want people, we want, you know, affirmation from people. We want this, we want that. And there's a lot of feelings involved, but then, at the end of the day, you, you, you choose against those, right? You can't always just follow your feet. You can't, well, I feel sad, so I'm going to be sad. I feel, I feel mad, so I'm going to get angry. I'm going to act angry. It's like, no, I'm like, no, I'm, I'm going to be, you know, I feel this, but I'm going to be something different. And so by the time it came around, you know, I had come to grips with it. I was okay. It wasn't like a life-changing ordeal. It wasn't like finally, because again, the, the goal was gold. I mean, I wanted to be a world Olympic champion and that didn't happen. So it's cool to be an Olympic medalist in the record books, but the reality is, is I'm not, you know, seven years later, I'm not walking around like, Hey guys, nice to roll logging. Nice to meet you. Olympic medalist or, you know, two time Olympian. I mean, that's just not something that I, that's something that's that, that I'm, I'm, I'm glad I went through. I'm proud of myself for, 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 Go, doing it. I'm really happy the opportunities it brought me, but it's also not something I'm, I, I hold on to so dearly that it needs to come up often. You know, it's like, it's a fun storytelling thing, stuff like, you know, times like this reminiscing is fun, but it's never something that I'm like, you know, standing in line at a grocery store and being like, hurry up. Do you know who I am? Like, it's just, it's not, you know, <laughs> And then, and then the opposite is true. The opposite is true. I'm never like sitting around at home going, how different will my life be if I would have just won it? 
Like how, how, uh, why couldn't I just, you know, so, I mean, there's plenty of people that have achieved the things I wanted to achieve and they're just not fun to be around because they're literally still talking about it. So it's like, I don't want to be that guy. I don't be 45 talking about 2012. And I, I, but, and I also don't want to be, you know, Hey guys, do you still think I'm good? I never won, but someone tell me I'm still good. You know, someone, you know, write about me in the message board. So, so it's at the time it was like this thing where you, you have to, a lot of the stuff we talk about is just self-reflection and then you just out loud, right? Where I think that's, that's where we miss the mark a lot as athletes is you, there's so many things you have to brainwash yourself to believe because, because achieving great things is so out of the realm of possibility in your brain until you actually do it. It's like winning the worlds, winning the nationals. I don't care what anyone says. It's like the first time you do it, it's pretty like, whoa, I actually, like you, some, you surprise yourself. Like, I, I can't believe I did it. And then once you do it and you do it again and again, it becomes an expectation. But the first time, it's really difficult to really, really believe like, yeah, I was going to win. You know, there, there has to be, there has to be some delusion in you and you have to like really force yourself to think that way. Right. And so I think that oftentimes creates this idea that honesty is weakness. Like don't say, don't tell the truth because, well, you're supposed to say what you want to happen, not what's actually real. So it's like, you know, moments like, Hey, like, you know, this guy's good. You're going to win. Like, nah, he sucks. I'm going to win. I'm the best. Right. Where it's like, in, in, where inside you're actually, holy crap, I'm super nervous. But you can't say that because, well, that's weakness. So I think it was just me, like, being real with myself and being like, man, like, losing sucks. And, you know, there's some places where I maybe could have won, but there's also some of these guys were just better and they just straight up beat me. And it's like, it's a humbling experience. But, I think once you can be honest with yourself and, and just talk honestly, it, it, it definitely, you, you get on the road to, to a healthy mental state. All right. Let me sign us off from the BA hour. Uh, we, we, we held you. I, I asked you if you're all right with overtime. You said you were all right with overtime. So of course okay. I took advantage of the overtime. Uh, check out all of our deals at uh, backslash BA hour. We send in some swag. I got to get you some swag for taking care of us. I'm going to cut this real quick. Terrell Delagnov, thank you for the time. Stick around, all right?